friends. Once upon a time, I was young. <laughs> when I was young, in the year 2000, I joined a small startup company with a silly name, and it was called Google. Uh, it was, it's true, actually. I was an engineer, uh, but in my defense, I was young and needed the money. So I joined this small startup as employee 107. And then in the year 2007, when Google was not so small and I was not so young anymore, I led the creation of a mindfulness-based emotional intelligence program called Search Inside Yourself. It's less naughty than it sounds. <laughs> Some people got a joke. <laughs> Yes, it's a sign up for a class. It's called Search Inside Oh, it's about emotional intelligence. Okay, wrong class, huh? <laughs> anyway, it became one of the most popular classes in all of Google. Uh, I think the story we tell is uh, uh, a class will fill up. Every time we open a class, it fills up in 30 seconds. And because of Bill, Bill expanded the number of classes by a factor of 10. Now it takes a full hour to, to fill a class. <laughs> so anyway, we created this class. Uh, and then in 2012, I felt that search inside yourself was good enough to be open sourced. In other words, to be used outside of Google. So I wrote this book called Search Inside Yourself. Uh, very creative. <laughs> by the way, this book is, uh, is endorsed by the Dalai Lama, President Jimmy Carter, and President Naden of Singapore, which is how you know it's a good book. <laughs> because all three of them cannot be wrong at the same time. I also, uh, after writing this book, uh, cr created or co-founded a non-profit institute to make Search Inside Yourself accessible to the world. And based on my experience 12 years earlier, joining a small startup company with a silly name, I decided that this institute is going to have a silly name. So we call it Silly. <laughs> By the way, it stands for something. Yeah, we, we, we sort of reverse engineer it. And it stands for the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. <laughs> so we found it silly. And then we decided, we decided this. We decided not to stop at mindfulness. But instead, we're going full Monty, uh, figuratively. <laughs> we decided to go full Monty towards, or rather to work towards fulfilling the full potential of mindfulness. And because of that, we gave ourselves this mission statement, that all leaders in the world are wise and compassionate, thus creating the conditions for world peace. Thank you. And that's, that's how I felt about myself when we did that. <laughs> we felt great. Yay, woo, right? However, uh, we harbored a dirty little secret. The dirty little secret is we left Wisdom and compassion undefined. So why? Why do we leave it undefined? Uh, because it's very hard. <laughs> it turns out, as Dan suggested, is, it is no, there's no uh, consensus definition of wisdom and compassion. It turns out that wisdom and compassion is a little bit like porn, like pornography. Right? You know it when you see it, but you cannot define it. <laughs> also like the mind, yeah, but, but this is, porn is funnier. So being an engineer, that's not good enough, right? So if you, if you don't mind indulging me, I'd like to share with, me my, share with you my current thinking on how we can define wisdom and compassion. And know that this is like preliminary thinking, so it may be wrong. And if it's wrong, it's because I don't have enough wisdom and I ask for your compassion. <laughs> My working definition of wisdom is this. It is clarity and insight that enables you to know what is best to do. And in my opinion, there are three parts to wisdom. As uh, Bill is smiling because I, I always say there are three things. There are three of this, there are three of that. Anyway, there are three parts to wisdom and compassion. The first part of wisdom is calmness of mind. Which is what? Which is the ability to bring the mind to a state that is calm and clear and to do it on demand. 
like things are going wrong, uh, everything's falling apart, and you can calm the mind on demand. And this, my friends, in my opinion, uh, is a wisdom faculty and is also a leadership faculty. So what does it mean? Imagine you're in a meeting room with all your peers, and imagine there's a crisis, and everybody is fresh. Like, oh my God, we're going to lose a lot of money. Ah, right? Everybody is panicking. You alone can calm the mind and think. What happens? Everybody looks at you and they think to themselves, this person, Bill, is a leader. Why? Because that is leadership. Leadership or part of leadership is the ability to think under fire. So if you have this faculty already, you are like 75% way to being a leader. On top of that, it is a wisdom faculty because it enables the other faculty. This is the foundation. The ability to calm the mind on demand is the foundation of all higher cognitive and emotional skills. So that leads us to the second uh, quality of, of wisdom. The second quality is self-awareness, which operates at a few levels. On one level, it is at a physiological level, the body level, it is clearly seeing moment to moment state of mind and emotions. So that's part of self-awareness. The other part of self-awareness is goes from the physiological level to the level of meaning, which is uh, knowing about myself. What are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? What makes me happy? What makes me sad? What, is, what are my purposes? What is my meaning? Those, that, that level. And that level depends on the first level, which is the ability to see moment to moment thoughts and emotions, or cognitive and emo emotive experiences. This self-awareness leads eventually to the ability for self-mastery. Uh, the, the third part, okay, this one is slightly tough. The third part of wisdom, in my opinion, is this. It is the insight that self is a process and not an object. Self is a process. Therefore, because it is a process and not an object, it is insubstantial, it is ever-changing, it is unsatisfactory, and as Dan suggested earlier, it is beyond this body. It is it goes to mind, it's a part of interaction with people, it is part of mind, it is part of the sense of self. So, in other words, wisdom is seeing, or rather, the ability to see beyond self. And by the way, I created all these slides before I heard the talk today by, by Dan and, and Lawrence, and I find that they're remarkably, I mean, my definition of wisdom, remarkably the same as theirs. So I'm not, I'm not too far wrong for a hanger. <laughs> so this is wisdom. What is compassion? Compassion has three parts. <laughs> My working definition of compassion is this. It is the one suggested by uh, Tupton Jinpa, which is a mental state. A mental state that is endowed with a sense of concern for the suffering of others, and, most importantly, for the, and, and the aspiration to see that suffering relieved. So, to s see suffering and want it to be relieved. And it has three parts. <laughs> the first part is beautiful intentions. And there are tr three beautiful intentions. And they are, the first is uh, uh, ahimsa, no harm. Uh, the, the intention to cause no harm. And uh, those of you who know about Gandhi, that is one of his most important guiding principles. None, uh, none harm. The second is the intention of goodwill, wanting to always be kind to others. The third, so this is just the intention. The third is the intention of generosity. And generosity is, generosity is so important that the board of silly, we, we unanimously voted to choose radical generosity as our prime directive. So it guides every one of our decisions and every, everything we do as silly. So these three intentions, they are very beautiful, right? Remember what they are? 
uh, uh, non-harm non or non-violence, goodwill, and generosity. These three, they are very beautiful. However, they are only intentions. And you cannot eat intentions. <laughs> Actually, in Singapore, you can eat everything. <laughs> but, but no intentions. <laughs> oh, by the way, can I make a joke about, can I make a joke about what you said earlier, John? So yesterday, we were at the, at the meditation, and, and Roshi John was talking about strong back and soft front. And I was like, I spent two weeks in Singapore. The food is so good. The soft front part is very easy. <laughs> so I have half of it nailed down already. <laughs> the second part of compassion is this. It's loving kindness, which is defined as the wish for others to be happy. And the best thing about... Hmm, maybe before that, can we do a... Okay, miss. the best thing about loving kindness is that it can be initiated with a thought. With a thought. And that's important why. Because every human being I've ever met who is conscious has the ability to initiate a thought. And what is the thought of loving kindness? It is this thought, which is looking at human being or thinking about human being and which I wish for this person to be happy. Shall we try this experiment? Okay, uh, secretly, Secretly, okay? Identify a human being in this room and then just think to yourself, I wish for that person to be happy. Don't, don't say out loud. Don't do anything. Don't go like, hey. <laughs> no, don't do that. Okay? That'd be embarrassing. I say. Just think to yourself, I wish for this person to be happy. Okay? Five seconds. Now. Thank you. That was five seconds. You notice something, you notice you're all smiling. Right? To be on the giving end of a kind thought is intrinsically rewarding. It brings you happiness. To be on the giving end, not even on the receiving end of a kind thought. And if that's true, and I think it is, this, is a, this alone is a, one of the secrets of happiness. Right? So if you do this a lot, you become very happy. You're wishing, randomly just wishing for people to be happy. And most importantly, it leads to the third faculty of compassion, which is compassionate action. So not just thinking, not just intention, not just happy thoughts, but doing stuff, action. Loving kindness, in my opinion, when it's sufficiently strong, it will naturally evolve into compassion. Because if you wish for people to be happy, and if they're strong enough, you cannot help but want to, be, want to free them from suffering. You want to help them. It creates a motivation. Um, so, it compels you to take actions. And I want to point out this la young lady. This young lady, uh, her, na her name is Vivian. Uh, she was 10 years old when this picture was taken. And what she was telling the Dalai Lama was this. Compassion is not compassion without action. Vivian telling the Dalai Lama. <laughs> it's true, I was there. Uh, yeah, uh, Tenzin was there as well. <laughs> And, and Dalai Lama was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Vivian is uniquely qualified to say this to the Dalai Lama. Why? Because uh, at the age of 10, she already spent two years as a philanthropist. When she was eight years old, she saw a picture of two child slaves uh, in, in uh, Asia. So she set an intention for herself. She wanted to free child slavery. And dad and mom, they were very supportive parents. They were like, okay, we need to raise a lot of money. How are we going to do that? She said, I'm going to sell lemonade to raise money to free child slavery. So she, her target was to, was to raise $100,000. And what she did was she, she had a, a lemonade stand. And every day for a whole year, rain or shine, she was manning the stand. And in one year, she raised $100,000 to free child slavery. Eight years old. So by the time she was nine, she, was, she did it. Which is why she can tell the Dalai Lama. Now said action, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk about compassionate business. So my friend, this is my current thinking. My current thinking is, this is how we can define wisdom and compassion. Which is, wisdom has three qualities. Uh, calmness of mind, self-awareness, and seeing beyond self. And compassion has three qualities, which is beautiful intentions, uh, loving kindness, and most importantly, in my opinion, action. All six are born of mindfulness. 
Because when you practice mindfulness, the first two skills it develops are first ability to calm the mind on demand and increasing deepening of self-awareness. So it covered the first two already. And then when you do that, the self-awareness becomes so sharp, you get the ability or the faculty to see beyond the self. And then when you do that, uh, naturally, you start to attune to other people. You start to attune to goodness. So you start to have beautiful intentions. You have beautiful intentions and you're looking at people, you start to have loving kindness and compassionate action. So all this begins with mindfulness, practice in the right way. Therefore, mindfulness is a foundation of wisdom and compassion, which leads us to an important question. What has all this got to do with business? The answer is everything. Because I'd like to suggest that business at its best is about helping people. Business is about feeding people, right? supplying bread, supplying rice. Business is about clothing people. Business is about providing goods and services. And in the case of Google, for example, it is about providing the world's, uh, giving people access to the world's knowledge and the world's cat videos. <laughs> At its best, business reduces net suffering in the world. So if we have all the businesses at its best, net suffering will keep going smaller and smaller. Eventually, I hope, going to zero. So if what I just said is true, then business at its, is at its best when the people in the business practice wisdom and compassion. Because when people in the business practice mindfulness, wisdom and compassion, then the business functions in the way it's supposed to function, which is to serve people and to reduce, reduce suffering in this world and business will get the best rewards, the best customer service, the most loyal workers, the most creative people, and the most money while serving people. Let me see, I want to end with, uh, with a story. This story involves uh, my friend, Dolores, my Google coworker. She's speaking tomorrow, which is why, uh, and I'm co-chair, right? I get to arrange the schedule, which is why I made sure to speak before her so I can embarrass her <laughs> by showing you this. <laughs> So you see here, this is a textbook, by the way. Uh, and Dolores, uh, she's so good that she's being highlighted in the textbook about leadership. Is Dolores here? Never mind, you can embarrass her tomorrow. <laughs> so some years ago, uh, Dolores, not long after Dolores became a people manager, she started receiving feedback on her performance. And she discovered that people describe her in these words. Supportive, caring, calm under pressure, compassionate. So that's what people were saying about her. And how did she feel? She was embarrassed. <laughs> she, was not, she was not just embarrassed, she was also disappointed. Because she was hoping to be described as visionary, strategic, you know, driven, right? Words that you are used to describe like known leaders. So she was disappointed, but fortunately for us, Dolores is also an authentic leader. So she thought about this, and, and she's a mindfulness practitioner. She came to an early SIY class, uh, changed her life. She decided she wanted to stay true to herself, regardless of what she felt. So she stayed true to herself, so she remained, or she decided to remain caring, calm, compassionate. And then something happened, which is that Dolores started to notice that she was receiving, or consistently receiving very high performance scores as a manager. So the other managers would come and tell her, no, your team is on fire. I mean, in a good way, not, not in a literal way. <laughs> your team is on fire. Like, they do amazing work. Right? The, the strategies is so good. Execution is so good. Like, what are you doing? Like, what do you do for that, creating these conditions? And what Dolores learned is a lesson that countless generations of great leaders have learned before her, which is that the best leadership is not about the leader. The best leadership is about the team. Outstanding leadership is something that enables a team to thrive and to shine. And therefore, in order to do that, to, uh, in order to do that leaders must facilitate individual team members to thrive and to work well with each other. And in order to do that, outstanding leadership means a practice of mindfulness, wisdom, compassion. So my friends, this, is, uh, this ends my prepared remarks. Uh, if in doubt, 
get silly. <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, so here's my silly crew. Uh, Mark is here. Uh, Mark and she's speaking tomorrow. Mark, can you extend and identify yourself? Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's, very, he's very shy. Yeah. Uh, and we have a few trained teachers, people who are trained to, to teach SIY as well. Uh, and that's it for now. And my friends, I hope that by working together, we can all create, all of us working together, can create a world where every leader is wise and compassionate, thereby creating the conditions for world peace. Thank you. Thank you, Ming. So we had a, uh, a plan that I was going to interview him, but I think it's actually going to be much more interesting to see what questions are out there. And um, so if you have a question for Ming, if you want uh, to ask him either about his uh, life um, in Singapore, his life at Google, his life doing his book, uh, now would be a good time. So we have a few people with mics. There's a, there's a hand over there. If there's hands that rise, mm -hmm. we will. Uh, yes. I think I might have to use a mic. <laughs> right. um, my question is, uh, I'm Singaporean, so I'm just intrigued. How would you, um, you know, how do you reconcile the spirit of wisdom and compassion with a very pragmatic society like Singapore? What would you do here? Ah, very easy. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing about wisdom and compassion is that they are competitive advantages. Right? They, make your, they make your company more profitable. Uh, give you simple examples. Uh, creativity. Or even simpler examples, sales. Right? Uh, what marks a best salesman? A best salesman is somebody who, who can understand and empathize with the, the, the client. The client likes the guy, buys from the guy. So that's it. Right? So therefore, if the salesperson is, in addition to being good, is also kind and compassionate, then you can get even more business because everybody wants to buy from this guy. So that's one example. The other example is leadership. Right? So if, if you have a leader who practices all these things, uh, he's calm, he's loving, everybody loves that guy, they want to work extra hard for him. And it has actually been shown in the research. For example, there was a study that shows that uh, this particular study was fascinating. They, they were comparing the, the top, the best leaders with the worst leaders in that one company. And they find that in that company, there's only one difference between the top and the bottom. The one difference is affection. The top leaders, the top performing leaders, love people and want to be loved. And because of that, uh, they create the kind of behaviors that make people want to work hard for them. So it turns out that goodness is good for business. So all other things equal. Some companies will figure out eventually that goodness is good for business, they will become good, uh, good uh, uh, character companies and then they will be competitive, and then they will gain more money and become bigger, and eventually, the ecosystem will be dominated with people, companies with good-hearted people. That's all. Simple. <laughs> um. It's a little hard to see with the light, so if you raise your hand, uh, the, somebody with the mic will find you. I think there's a hand over here. Yeah, so if you stand yeah, in this up. Section. Yeah, you need to stand up. So, uh, if you stand up, we'll get the... Oh, who is going to win? Oh. Thank you. Hi. My name is Lina Green, and I have kind of two questions. The mm -hmm. first one is related to um, the question that the gentleman asked you yes. in your answer. So there yes. are two different components to it, right? There's yes. the short-term gain yes. and the long-term gain. Correct. And we know that in the long term, it yes. makes good business sense, but sometimes yes. in the short term, mm. it does appear to be a very cutthroat world yes. uh, like Silicon Valley is. I happen to be there for 14 years myself. I'm so sorry. Um, I know. <laughs> I just recently moved back to Singapore, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and my second part was more uh, related to the questions that were raised this morning as well on mindfulness, mm -hmm. where yes. uh, Dr. Tenzin was talking about how some people practice mindfulness yes. to get more productive and yes. self-absorbed, yes. which tends to happen in Silicon Valley a lot, yes. of course. How do you see mindfulness? Because it's intriguing for me to yes. see you as an engineer yes. going into mindfulness. Yes. How did you make that conversion yourself? And the second part is how do you see companies in the Bay Area adopting that? Are they adopting it 
into mm. the wisdom and compassion, or are they right. looking at it purely from competitive yes. advantage and productivity? I answer the second question first. Uh, and as far as I know, and uh, people who are doing this are all my friends, uh, we are we're all doing it out of uh, pure intentions. And, and the reason is because uh, the Silicon Valley is, is a very idealistic place. And so we are, all, we are doing it out of idealism to try to create a better world. So at least as an intention. What comes out is a slightly different, uh, uh, it may or may not match the intention. Uh, the first part of the question, I want to tell you a, a, a story. Uh, this is actually a research study, and the, the, the result was to me was surprising. Oh, I'm almost out of time. Okay, last question, I say. So the study was this. Uh, you, you get a bunch of people to go into a room. Uh, you, you tell them they are feeling some form or something. Uh, what they don't know is that uh, the people inside the waiting room are all confederates, so they're working for the researcher. So this person walk in, and there are like three chairs in the room. So, so two, two people sitting down, uh, subject sits down, and then somebody walks in with, uh, with crutches. Uh, looks like he's in pain. And the other two, because they're working for the experimenter, they just pretend they don't care. They just... So the question is, will the, the subject, will the subject stand up for the person who's injured? Right. Uh, because given the setting, there's, peer, there's a peer, uh, there's a norm already set, which is they don't stand up. So in the control condition, which is nothing happens, about one third of the time, this person will stand up and give a seat. So the research question is this. The first con research condition is, what if we teach them mindfulness? Would that change? The second question is, what if we teach them compassion meditation? Would that change, and how would it be different? So the part that surprised me, so the part that did not surprise me, is that both conditions, uh, they increase the probability of a person standing up. The part that surprised me is that they increase by the same amount. Mm. Right. So it, I thought the compassion condition would increase it more. And at least for that study, the hypothesis is that sometimes for compassion, all you need is awareness. Right? If aware of suffering, then you do the right thing. So my own belief is that mindfulness, if taught the right way, if taught by the right person, the person who embodies kindness and compassion, will always eventually lead to the good result. If taught the not necessarily the right way, I think you will also lead a good result, but takes much longer. So that's it. <laughs> Was there a second question, or did you feel oh, like the, you already I've, 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 done the, I've done both. So what do you want to do? <laughs> time is up. Do you want one more? Uh, yeah, my, do you mind staying for a little bit more? Because my time is up. But do you want to take one more question? What if we do one more question? OK. Yeah, I see somebody back here. OK. And there's dance music coming, so we can. Dance music, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, there's a hand over there in the center uh, block. Okay, we'll uh, uh, okay. go oh. wherever you want to go. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, okay. Uh, whoever has a mic wins. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just curious, and then it's not like I'll doubt, I'm doubt, doubting it, mm. but uh, you said you want to make world peace, right? Mm. Mm. So I really want to make world peace too, but I just really want to what your definition of the world peace, because that's what your vision. So I really want to know about it. Uh, can you say that again? I didn't get it. Um, what's the de definition of the word peace? How will you because that's what you're aiming for. Ah, so how do I know when I achieve it, right? Yes, ah. and also what it is. Right? Uh, so the real answer is I don't know. Uh, but I do have partial answers. So the partial, oh, by the way, I, I tell you the answer that I tell the press. Right? The, kind of, sounds, sounds kind of nice which is, uh, how do I know I achieve my goal? When there's peace in every heart, joy in every mind, and compassion in every action. Yeah, sounds good. What does that mean, Mzai? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but that's a good tagline, right? That's a good headline. Yeah, I don't know. yeah peace in every heart, joy in every mind, you know, compassion in every action. Uh, so still, that didn't answer the question, even though it sounds good on TV. Uh, the real, there's a partial answer. The partial answer is there are some aspects of peace that is measurable. And in Australia, there's an there's a institute that does that. And the way they measure is the inverse of violence, right? which is not a perfect measure, but it's pretty good. And because you have a measure with numbers, you can do correlational studies, and you can show that societies with a lower violence, they lead to higher prosperity, for example. Right? And you can see what things you can, what interventions you can do. Right? For example, get a community to meditate, whether they will lower violence, and so on. So the answer to your question is, I don't really know. Uh, what I do know is that I have to put in the effort. 
Uh, the joke I tell my friends, I, to I told you this a lot, which is when I started this, uh, trying to create the conditions for world peace, I knew it was impossible. I just didn't know it would be hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, it became hard when I realized it's not entirely impossible. And there's one more thing before we close, which is uh, it's not, I'm not trying to create world peace. I'm trying to create the conditions for world peace in my lifetime. And there's a difference. It's because what happens is not up to me. It's up to a higher power. Like, this, I'm not entitled to the result. What I am, I am entitled to is the effort. Mm. And because I'm entitled only to the effort, not the result, so all I can do is to try to create the conditions to the best I can. And then what happens? I let go, and let it happen. Great. Thank you. Thank you.